Colossians chapter number 3, we'll read verse number 2. The Bible says, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Can I say, most of our problems would be solved if we'd live that verse right there. It's so good, I'm going to read it again. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. The writer of Hebrews said this, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. See, too many times we spend too much time looking around instead of looking up. So let's pray. Father, we bless you. We thank you, Lord, for the good singing. Thank you for the good testimonies. Thank you for being a good God. Now, Father, I thank you for allowing us on this Wednesday evening to come out and worship you. We're thankful for the truth of thy word. We're thankful, Lord, for the, uh, the love and the kindness of thy people. We're certainly thankful for your tender mercy, your marvelous grace, and, Lord, your loving kindness. I pray that you'd meet every need of every heart here tonight. Lord, we are a needy people. We live in a wicked world. And Lord, we need to see a move of God in these days if folks are ever going to be drawn to Christ. Uh, Lord, we live in a day and age where folks are interested in everything but the Bible and truth. Uh, and so, Father, I pray for the power of God to fall on your churches. I pray that, Lord, we'd see uh, uh, the sweet Holy Ghost draw sinners to repentance. Uh, God, I pray that we'd see Jesus high and lifted up in our midst. Uh, Father, help us to live, verse number 2. Uh, help us, Lord, to strive to set our affections on things above. Uh, Father, I pray for the next few minutes you'd use this unworthy vessel. I pray that you'd speak to our hearts. Uh, Father, you know the need of every heart in this sanctuary tonight. Uh, Father, those that are watching. Father, I pray you'd do a work. Uh, I pray that, Father, uh, uh, you'd meet every need. Uh, Father, I certainly pray that you'd uh, help us, Lord, ever uh, draw closer to God. Uh, help us, Lord, ever have a, a hunger and a thirst for you and your righteousness uh, like never before. Uh, Father, we certainly pray in a crowd this size, uh, if there be any that does not know Jesus Christ and the free pardon of sins, uh, I pray tonight for a Holy Ghost conviction. Uh, I pray they'd see themselves lost without Christ. Uh, God, I pray tonight would be the night they get birthed into the family of God. Uh, Father, I pray that, Lord, you'd work accordingly. Uh, I pray the Holy Spirit wouldn't be grieved or quenched, uh, but allowed to do his office work. Uh, Father, have your will and way. Uh, help me to say everything you'd have me to say. Uh, and God, Father, help me not say anything contrary to the word or will of God. Uh, Father, glorify your namesake. Uh, we'll bless you for it. Uh, for it's in the holy and wonderful name of the Lord Jesus we ask these things. Uh, amen. Uh, and amen. Uh, in this chapter, uh, we find several things uh, about the believer. Uh, can I say, first of all, uh, we find the believer's position uh, in Christ. Uh, look in verse number 1. Uh, it says, If ye the be, then be risen with Christ, uh, seek those things which are above, uh, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, uh, not on the things on earth. Uh, for ye are dead, uh, and your life is hid with Christ uh, in God. Uh, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, uh, then shall ye also appear with him uh, in glory. Uh, I'm glad my position is in Christ. Uh, I'm glad I've, I've died. Uh, I'm dead to trespasses and sins, uh, and I've been raised in newness of life uh, by the Spirit of God when he quickened me uh, and made me alive spiritually. Uh, all that I have, uh, all that I desire uh, is what I have in Christ. Uh, in me there is no righteousness. Uh, in me there is nothing good. Uh, in me there is no hope. Uh, but in Christ uh, I've been robed in his righteousness. Uh, he is my peace. Uh, he is my hope. Uh, he is my life. Uh, and he is beyond good. Uh, he is holy. Uh, and through him I can desire and strive to live a holy life.
believe. Uh, what a blessing to have that tonight. Uh, I heard a song the other day. I've heard it many times before, and it's one of them songs that gets under my skin. Do you ever have anything get in your crawl? Yes, this song is 90% scriptural. But that 10% that's not scriptural gets all over me. It talks about being in the family of God, and it's, it's got a line in that song, Brother Bell, it says, His royal blood now flows through my veins. That's not true. Oh my, right. If His blood flowed through my veins, I wouldn't sin. Right. Right. Uh, if His blood flowed through my veins, I could just walk into the presence of God uh, and walk back here on earth. Uh, but his blood does not flow through my veins. His blood cleanses me from my sin. His blood is a perpetual covenant on the mercy seat before the throne of God as a testimony of those that have trusted in him. My dear friends, I'm saved. I'm washed in the blood of Christ, but his blood does not dwell in me. Matter of fact, the, the apostle Paul said that in me, in this flesh, dwelleth no good thing. Uh, and so we find our position in Christ. In Christ, we've been made joint heirs to the throne of Christ. In Christ, we have uh, been made kings and priests unto our God. Uh, in Christ, we are saved, uh, sealed, uh, and we're already seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Uh, blessed be the name of the Lord uh, for our position in Christ. One of these days, this is going to catch up with our position when we put off this mortal and put on immortality and dwell with the Lord evermore. Uh, so we find in verses 1 through 4 uh, the believer's position in Christ. In verses 5 through 10 we find the believer's practice because of Christ. Now I'm going to slow down here a little bit because I want to make sure you get this. Because this is how Christians are supposed to live. But unfortunately, uh, 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 Brother Peter... Uh, I don't find uh, everywhere that everybody that names the name of Christ lives this way. Can I say that in God there are no big eyes and little U's? God is no respecter of persons. And what God expects from the pastor, he also expects from the youngest believer in the house. Amen. Mm -hmm. But somewhere along the line, we got the minds where you know, preachers are supposed to live one way and the rest of us live however we want to until we come to church. Well, that's not what the Bible teaches. That's what Joe Osteen and Joyce Myers teach. That's why you better get your nose in the Bible. Because you're going to give an account of every word spoken from the Word of God. Uh, but listen, verse number 5, and this is our practice because of Christ. This is what we're, how we're supposed to conduct ourselves. It says, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, or an inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things sakes the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them. Past tense. But now, present tense. Ye also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth, lie not one to another, seeing that ye put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man, which is renewed in the knowledge after the image of him that created him. Now notice how, how the, the practice of a, of a believer, how we're supposed to live our lives. The first word, he says, is mortify. That word mortify means to deprive a thing of its power. It also means to destroy its strength. It also means to put to death. Now I want to tell you something, that if you do not keep your flesh in check, your flesh can do any vile, filthy thing that any vile, filthy sinner can do. You say, preacher, how come there's preachers that fall to sin? They do not mortify their flesh. Preacher, how come there are folks that I, I know they used to live for God, but now they're living for the, for the devil? What's going on? They did not pay attention to this verse. My dear friends, if you do not deprive the thing of its power, 
whichever you feed the most, your inner man or your outer man, will be the strongest. So you've got to learn to mortify it. You've got to put into practice putting your flesh to death. Depriving it of its strength. Depriving it of its power. Now listen. Every one of us are different. But we all face the same devil, the same world, and the same rotten flesh. Can I help you something? My soul is saved, but my flesh isn't saved. That's why this flesh will not uh, see the Lord Jesus Christ. No man can see God in his flesh and live. That's why he's got to change us and give us a body fashioned to like, his, like unto himself. Right. My dear friends, your flesh isn't saved. Amen. Let me help you something. Your mind isn't saved. Hmm? And if you're not careful, you'll let your mind run away with, with something from the world. You'll let your flesh run away with something in the world and you'll end up in trouble. Now, Brother Ed, what the devil may use to tempt you may never even bother me. But what he uses to tempt me may never bother you, but he does know how to tempt us. And if you do not crucify your flesh, if you feed your flesh, you're going to be in trouble. Yes, hmm? A lot of people in trouble tonight. A lot of people have lost their testimony. A lot of people uh, uh, have uh, watched, had people watch their lives and won't come to Christ because folks that knew Christ, uh, folks that uh, uh, have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ uh, did not mortify their flesh uh, and they've trampled the blood of Christ under their feet. Uh, and when people see their life, they say, if that's all God's got to offer, I don't need that. Amen. So he tells us to mortify our members, our flesh what our makeup is. Mortify it. Put it to death. The great apostle Paul, he, he, had a, he had a problem with the flesh like we do. Read Romans chapter 7, but he went on to say this, that he said, I die daily. Every day you ought to get up and you ought to die. You ought to crucify your flesh. Every day you ought to ask God for help and for grace uh, uh, to get beyond you. Hmm. And if there's something that you know feeds your pl flesh, you ought to run from it. Mm. You ought to. Because the devil will keep pounding you with that. But the Bible does say resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Right. But notice what he, he tells us things that ought to be mortified, not even another place that shouldn't even be named among the saints. He says fornication. That is sex outside of marriage. Right. Now, I know that isn't popular preaching, but it's Bible. Right. Uh, uh, I, listen, uh, 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 having a relationship with somebody is not like buying a used car where you kick the tires and try it out and see if you like it or not. Uh, that's not marriage. You know what marriage is? Uh, getting on your face before God and asking God to send you the right mate. Uh, and when he does, keep yourself pure uh, and marry that person uh, and raise uh, a family to the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Amen. But fornication, sex outside of marriage, is sin. I said it's sin. And by the way, you can't sin and win. And I know preaching on sin isn't popular, but it's still right, huh? So, well, I don't like that hell fire brimstone. I ain't even preaching on hell. I'm just preaching on sin. But sin will lead you to hell. You're saved. You can see it in people and trip in and over your, your wicked life and die and go to hell. We're to be holy as he's holy. We find that fornication is sin, sex outside of marriage. Then he says, uncleanness. That's living an unclean life. That's living, living a life that looks worldly. Listen, if it looks like a duck, if it quacks, if it has webbed feet, if it has feathers, then it's a duck. If it looks like the world, acts like the world, sounds like the world, smells like the world, it's of the world. And we're not to live an unclean life. We're to come and out and be a separate, saith the Lord. Uh, 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 folks ought to see something different. Brother Clint sang that song uh, uh, about being different now. Uh, what made us different? Uh, 
If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Uh, old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. Uh, what's the difference? Uh, when you got saved, the Holy Ghost moved inside of you. Uh, and you're to be different. Paul said, work out your salvation. Uh, what's that mean? Uh, that means that which God's put in you, let it work out through you that folks can see God in your life. Uh, you're not to live an unclean life. Not to be in a honky-tonk on Saturday night singing Wailing Jennings and then come to church and sit in the choir on Sunday morning and sing How I Love Jesus. That's an unclean life. God's not the author of confusion. It's going over real well tonight. I ain't even got to the title. I'm going to preach it. If it hair lifts the devil, Brother Brian, you know me. You've been here long enough. I'm going to preach it. <clears throat> I told y'all when I was in Grenada, I was in the devil's backyard. You think I'm afraid around here? Lord have mercy, huh? Can I say not only uncleanness, inordinate affection. What is that? That's unnatural or not normal. Our country has gone crazy. Well, I won't say our country. Can I say an element of our country? which is only about 4 or 5% of the population, has gone crazy. They've robbed us of the rainbow, uh, and they're making this month uh, all about lions, I guess, because don't lions live in prides? Yeah. No? Uh, all I got to say is the Bible says God resisted the proud but gives grace to the humble. Uh, can I say it is not natural... Miss Marcy, for you to love Miss Mary in a biblical way. Now, you're to love her as a sister in Christ. You're to love her as a friend. You know, David and John and lo Jonathan loved each other as, as their own soul. There's nothing wrong in having a, a strong bond of love and the love of God working through you towards somebody, but it's unnatural when you do it in a sensual way. You do it in an unnatural way. Colton, I love you. If I ever hear of you having a thing for a monkey, I'm going to smack you. That's unnatural. Uh -uh. Uh. Aiden's laughing. I'll smack you too, son. I, I picked him out because I could see him, you know, falling in love with, you know, a chimpanzee. You know, Colton's kind of different. You say, preach, that's crazy. You know there are things a lot more wicked than that going on in this world. It's unnatural. Inordinate affection. When giving yourself to something that's not normal. By the way, God only created two genders. By the way, there's only two genders. By the way, if you're a man, you can't get pregnant. Huh? If you're a woman and you're with a man that wants to get pregnant, run. But we're living in a day and age where they're trying to tell our children that when they were born, the doctor just took a guess at their gender and that the child gets to choose their gender when they're a little bit older. That's what they're teaching children in schools. Huh? Listen again. God makes no mistakes. Uh, hey, uh, uh, and God's not the author of confusion. Uh, you was either born as a male uh, or a female. Uh, so I don't like that. Well, take it up with God. He's the one who made you. But we live in a day and age where they're trying to confuse innocent, pure minded children. Uh, do you know why in some states it's okay for drag queens to go in and put on a performance before kindergartens and first graders? Because they're perverts seeking uh, the first graders and the kindergarten kids, uh, and they're wanting to, uh, to molest them and pervert them uh, and raise them up to think that that's normal. Mm. Listen. It was a black eye in America when we allowed uh, same-sex marriage, but it's even a worse black eye that they allow them to adopt children. How do you think they're raising them children to be perverts like them? You say, Brother Doug, I, I really don't. That's making me uncomfortable. I'm sorry, but inordinate affection is a sin. It should never be named among the household of faith. 
Hmm? You know why it's happening in some churches? Because preachers don't preach like this. Hmm. By the way, men, the Bible says, quit you like men. God made you a man. Be a man. Don't be prissy. Don't be a sissy. Be a man. That's what God made you to be. And no uh, uh, God-fearing woman wants a sissy, prissy man. She wants a man that's going to follow God, uh, that's going to seek after God, that's going to get the mind of God for the protection and safety of their home. Uh, well, I know. Done lost you. Well, hang on. He also says evil concupiscence. What does that mean? Lustful passions. Evil, lustful passions. The Bible says, For him to know to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. And there are some things that are evil and wicked. And if you're not careful, you'll lust after those things and desire those things. And by the way, that's not always sexual. Huh? Uh, some of them... Uh, uh, movies you like that are blood and gore and all that. If you're not careful, you watch enough of them, you'll start lusting to try and be like that. Mm -mm. Amen. I've told you all this before, but years ago, back when I got my computer programming degree, I'm talking years ago because what I learned is obsolete. But one fact about computers is something they used to call GIGO. Garbage in, garbage out. What you put in the computer is what's going to come out. So when you don't put in the right password, don't get mad at the computer. It's just looking for the right password. And if you put in the wrong command and it doesn't get it, give you what you put in, uh, 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 what you was wanting because you didn't put in, it's not the computer's fault. The computer is not all-knowing. It just does what you tell it to do. Now, there are certain programs that are designed to try and help you in certain areas by making you think that this is what you need and it's maybe not what you need. But what I'm trying to say is if you allow garbage in your mind and in your life, guess what's coming out of your life? Garbage. Hmm? Uh, there are just some things you need to protect yourself for. Because can I say once it goes in your mind, you'll never, you'll never be able to totally erase it. Hmm? I don't know. Maybe I'm the oddball in the place. But I'll go walking through a shopping center or something, and all of a sudden a song from the 70s go on, comes on, and I go right back to that time. I can remember what I was doing. I can remember what car I was in and what, what, what I was running around. Or what I, I can remember that stuff. Why? I mean, I hadn't heard that music in decades, but all of a sudden it takes me right, because it's in your mind. you got to be careful. What you allow your eyes to focus on, what you allow your, your ears to hear, what you allow to be exposed to your mind. It's just like Brother Cato could tell you tonight. What you put in your body, there's a payday someday. Hmm. Listen, God forgives sin, but there's a lot of scars in our life from that sin to remind us of what sin cost us. Hmm. God forgives sin, but God don't eradicate it like it was never in our life. Now, He forgets it, but that don't mean you will. Mm. Um, but we find... i got to get through this. Lord, have mercy. Uh, we find He also mentions uh, 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 idolatry. Can I say, we just came, Miss Annette and I was in a village where they were, you know, witches and voodoo and idols everywhere and they worship that stuff and, and listen uh, uh, put a little uh, thing on a man on praying to it isn't the only idols anything that you put ahead of God in your life becomes your idol mm. uh, and if you serve that more than you serve God it's idolatry mm. it goes on to say in verse 8 that we're to put off anger oh boy I'm looking for a place to hide uh, did you ever get mad, uncontrollable anger? And your anger just uh, continued to fuel you, and that anger will turn into bitterness, friend. He said, put it off. Mm. He told us not to let the sun go down on our anger, on our wrath. 
You need to get it taken care of or it will control you. And by the way, he who angers you does control you because that's all you think about. We put off our anger, put off our wrath, put off our malice, our blasphemy, our filthy communication out of your mouth. Uh Uh-oh. Here's a good rule of thumb. If you can't say it in here, you shouldn't say it anywhere else. Uh, And by the way, if you mention God's name and you're not talking to him or you're not talking about him, it's in vain. I've heard people say, oh, God, that's wicked. Hmm? You're welcome. I didn't cost you anything. So we, we see he deals with the believer's position in Christ, the believer's practice because of Christ. But in verse 12, he starts dealing with a believer who pleases Christ. Look what he says. You know, all that other stuff was putting off. Now he's talking about putting on something. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. Boy, I'm getting under conviction just reading some of this stuff, aren't you? Huh? I'm not always humble. I'm not always kind. I'm not always long-suffering. Uh, I, I, I'm not always uh, 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 have bowels of mercy to people. Uh, goes on to say, verse 13, forbearing one another. Uh-oh. That means put up with people even though you know, might not always really agree with them. Right. You might not understand why they're doing what they're doing. And so you, know, you want to write them off. God says to forbear them. Hmm? He also said in Galatians 6, bear you one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. He said, forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Huh? Listen, I know it's a good thing when somebody comes and apologizes to you because they've been talking to you like a, like a dog and you know it. But you know what to help you in your spirit? Go ahead and forgive them before they come and ask for forgiveness. Hmm? Uh, so well, they didn't ask for it yeah but there's been a lot of times that God's winked at my ignorance because Christ forgave me uh, just go ahead and forgive them so well, they don't deserve it you didn't deserve God's forgiveness I mean how long you want to argue with me just go ahead and forgive them uh, so we find he says that verse 13 verse 14 he says and let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Boy, wouldn't that be a blessing if all God's people had the peace of God in their hearts? Uh, to the which also you are called into one body, and be ye thankful. Oh, what a blessing it would be if God's people were just thankful. Sure. I want to tell you, if you'd have been where Miss Annette and I were a couple weeks ago, and you got back on American soil, you'd be thankful. Mm. Those people had nothing, but they had joy. We've got everything, and we're miserable. Hmm. Uh, he goes on to verse 16 let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns uh, and spiritual songs singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord and whatsoever ye do in word or deed do all in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks to God and the Father by him Ooh, verses 12 through 17 is what it takes to please Christ this is what I want to preach on in just a few minutes. I preach longer than I will preach. I want to preach on this thought. The kind of Christian every Christian should be. The kind of Christian that every Christian should be. Anybody remember Louis Armstrong? Satchmo? I love Louis Armstrong. You talk about a trumpet player. And you talk about a big personality. He sang a song that's become famous what a world that would be what a world this would be if every Christian was the kind of Christian they should be you know we wouldn't have the welfare program in America if every Christian was the Christian that they were supposed to be you know we wouldn't have a lot of the wickedness in America we wouldn't have a lot of the problems we got in our homes Uh, we wouldn't have a lot of things that we're dealing with if every Christian was the Christian they should be Can I say, every Christian should be positive. Two people, amen. You know why? Because the rest of us are guilty. Mm. Instead of half full, we see half empty. Can I say this? We live in a negative world. Can I say that 
The powers of be those that really run the world. And by the way, Joe Biden doesn't run anything. He runs oatmeal down his chin when he eats breakfast. That's the only thing he's running. Uh, he, he wasn't voted to be in charge. He's not in charge. Uh, there's people behind him that prop him up and they put a teleprompter and tell him, do the best you can, Joe, to read them words. Uh, but the people who's really running this thing, they have it designed from the news media to what's coming out of Washington to what's taught in our schools. Uh, everything is negative. Amen. Negative. Hmm? You watch the news, you're depressed. Huh? It's not bad enough that there's a lot of bad things happening in our communities. But if they can't find nothing, Brother Jim, they'll show you some story and you're thinking, oh man, where did this happen? You know, when did this happen? It, it happened in Georgia. Well, why am I seeing a story about Georgia's community when we got our own community? Why? Because they're constantly pumping out negative things. And I don't care if a hunter falls out of a deer stand in Montana and his gun goes off and he shoots himself in the foot, you're going to hear there was a gun shooting. Yeah. You know more people die from so much more things than gun violence yeah. in this world, but you never hear about it. Can I say gun violence don't even scratch the surface to heart disease? How come every time somebody dies of a heart attack, it doesn't make the headline news? Because there's an agenda. Because they can't totally control America till they, till they unarm America. They make America like Europe. Huh? And that's what they're pushing for. Do you know in the country of France, in the last 15 years, there's been four churches built, but there's been over a thousand mosques built? That's what they want America to become. Anti-Christian. Do you know that uh, 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 the Department of Homeland Security actually came out this past week and gave an agenda of people that are a threat to America and one of the threats are fundamental Christians? Right. They admitted it. They're scared to death of us. You know why? They can't control us because we've been bought with a price. Yeah. Well, I'm saying all this to say if you keep looking around and don't set your th affection on things above you're going to be negative right. and it's easy to be negative I don't like your shirt that's negative there's nothing positive about that I say, that's a beautiful shirt hallelujah at least you don't look like that again that's negative it's easy to be negative it's easy to find fault why do you think in America they push, they push, they push the race issue? Right. It's negative. Right. I've been in the islands uh, 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 several times in the last several months, and you know what the people in the islands do about the race issue in America? They laugh at it. They think that's the craziest thing they ever heard of. Uh, you know why we have a race issue in America? Because we have a media that pushes it. Uh, Brother Bell, you've been my friend for over 20 years. Uh, when I see you, I don't see color. I see a friend. I see a brother in the Lord. But yet I've been called a racist because I preach the way I'm preaching. Well, call me whatever you want to. Just when Jesus calls me, I, he, I'm going home. So, you know, he's calling me home. I don't know. But see, when, when you don't agree with what they're pushing, then you become a threat. You know what would be the greatest threat to this country? If we just became positive. Positive. And it starts with not listening to the world's agenda, but set your affection on things above. Say, boy, it's getting wet and rough in the world. Well, Jesus said in the last days, perilous times shall come. So hallelujah, that means we're almost home. What a blessing. You know what that is? That's positive. So-and-so's not at church tonight. Well, instead of being negative like that, say, oh, no, so-and-so's not here tonight. I ought to pray for him. That's positive. Sure. See, it's easy to talk about somebody, 
But if we do something about, oh, well, I don't know who normally sits here. Well, let's pray for them. They're not here. Maybe something's going on. Maybe the devil's attacking them. Maybe they're sick. Maybe, you know, they're facing something that they're, they, they would never want to burden the church about. So let's just pray. God, just dump some extra grace on them. And Lord, help them to be back Sunday because I miss them and I want to see them. Not because I'm judging because their seat's empty. You know? But see, that's positive. We don't like to be positive. Because we like to say, well, where's Josh at tonight? Sorry, no good. Huh? You know, I can't help you head all them youngins. He's got to work to feed y'all. Quit having youngins. Fast. <laughs> oh, and you're the smart one out of the whole family. Go find some plants in your backyard you can eat so your daddy don't have to work so much, all right? Just go pick something off a tree and start eating it. It'll be all right. No, we want, to be, we want to be negative. We want to judge people. We want to find fault in people. All that's negative. Can I say, nowhere in the Bible does God give us a license to judge people uh, or to judge their motivations uh, or to try and figure out people. I've learned this. You'll never figure out people. Uh, so why don't we just be positive, learn to pray for people, uh, learn to praise the Lord regardless of circumstances, uh, and just be positive. Can you imagine what? What, what this world would be if every church was filled with positive believers. What a blessing. Give me 25% positive. I'll take that. Trust me, you don't want to answer my phone calls. There are a lot of folks got a lot of problems. And a lot of them are self-made. Or a lot of them are easy to overcome, but they just don't want to do what it takes to overcome. They'd rather just complain about how miserable they are. Just be positive. Man, if every Christian was positive, whoo, whoo, we really would be a threat to this country. Every Christian should be positive. Can I say this? Every Christian should be peaceable. Hmm? You say, what, is, what does that mean? That means be composed. Listen, the Bible says, they that live godly shall suffer persecution. I'd like to tell you that Joel's right, and every day's a Friday, but every day's not a Friday, and sometimes I've had Fridays that weren't good days. Huh? Job said that man's days were few and full of trouble. As long as you're breathing God's air, as long as you're walking in this flesh, you are a subject for something bad to happen. Can I say bad things happen to good people all the time? Can I say just because you go through a trial, just because you're facing something, doesn't mean you're out of the will of God, doesn't mean you're wicked, doesn't even mean you're sinned. It just means you're human. You're going to face things. But can I say... When we face things, we shouldn't fall apart. Amen. We should have some composure about us. Yes. I've learned this. It didn't catch God by surprise. Right. Might have caught me totally off guard. Didn't catch him by surprise, so I'm going to talk to him about it. Sunday afternoon when Miss Nett came and said Christian Tay was picking her up and taking the baby to the hospital, in my flesh I wanted to fall apart. That's my grandbaby. But I didn't fall apart. I fell into the Lord. I just went in my office. I said, Lord, you know what's going on? Just help me with it. Well, he gave me a verse. I read the verse. I had peace. I knew Ella Rose was going to be fine. I had people even ask, Preacher, what are you doing here Sunday night? What are you doing here? You should be at the hospital. Well, there was already enough support at the hospital. But can I say, I wasn't at the hospital because I had peace. And I was doing what I was supposed to do. You've got to have composure. You've got to be peaceable. Listen, you get a flat tire on the side of the road, didn't catch God by surprise. And it might protect you from an accident on down the road you'd been in. Right. And so you need to learn to praise God even for the flat tires. Right. Uh, but peaceable not only means composed, it means unalarmed. You should never be surprised something's going to happen because something always happens. 
Uh, and if God reaches in his shepherd's bag and he pulls you out because you're a smooth stone uh, and the water of the word of God and the water of the Holy Spirit has been working on you and God chooses you for anything, what a blessing uh, that God even looks at our way and counts us worthy to suffer for his name's sake. Should be unalarmed. Should be untroubled. That's hard. We live in the flesh. It's easy to be troubled, especially when it's one of our youngins. Yes, sir. But listen, where's Miss Crystal? Who's got the baby? Did you already give her away? Oh, Lexi. Listen, as much as you love that little little baby Elizabeth, as much as you love Sammy Joe and Kenzie and even Xander, and I know you love Xander, as much as you love those children, as much as you care about them, concerned about them, think about them, or worried when they're out of your sight and what they're being exposed to. Not. God loves them more. He loves them more. He loves them more. And so if God is doing a work and God is stirring in your family, just learn to be peaceable. Job said it best, Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. Uh, right. That's being a peaceable. But can I say, in order to be peaceable, you have to be at peace with God. If things between you and God aren't right, you can never be peaceable when trouble Amen. comes. And if things between you and God aren't right, maybe something's coming so that you will get right. He does chasten his children. Every Christian should be positive, should be peaceable. Every Christian should be a praying Christian. I know that should be foreign that we have to preach that you've got to pray, but can I say, you've got to pray. Uh, we're to pray without ceasing. We're to pray always in the Spirit with all thanksgiving. Can I say, throughout the Bible, it tells us to pray. Why? God speaks to us through His Word. We speak to Him in prayer. And by the way, you don't have to have all the these and thous in your prayer life. He already sees your heart. He knows what you mean in your heart, even if you mess the words up. But praying is a conscious effort to show your dependence on God. Can I say, it's okay to pray without even asking Him for anything. It's okay to pray and tell Him how wonderful He is. The kind of Christian every Christian should be. Every Christian should be positive. Every Christian should be peaceful. Every Christian ought to be a praying Christian. Every Christian ought to be perceptive. To be able to discern if God is speaking through His Word or through His Spirit or if He's not speaking. The pastor won't have as many heart attacks and his hair won't turn as gray quick as quickly if everybody would learn to discern the Spirit of God. You'll never discern, learn to discern Him. You'll never be perceptive till you spend time and time and time with Him in His Word and learning His still, small voice. When I ask for testimonies, it's not a time for prayer requests. Tonight, y'all did good. A lot of times I say, anybody got a testimony? Want to brag on Jesus? Pray for my toes. I got an ingrown toe. Now. Boy, that really edified people. It shows no discernment. Pray for my dog. It's cross-eyed. Who cares about your dog? I know how to help your dog. Give it to a little Chinese fella and make soup out of it. It'll be all right. Uh, what I'm saying is there are some people that have no perception when you're in the house of God. Some people want to speak just because they like to hear themselves speak. If it doesn't edify the body of Christ, and if it doesn't bring glory to God, then we need to keep our mouths shut. One of the hardest things that I have to do, Brother Ray, is get people to see it the way God shows me. The second thing, the hardest thing to do is people to get it. To learn to discern whether God is speaking or not. Hi, Miss Tina, how you doing? Your husband won't sit with you. But well, he wants to go on vacation for nine days. 
Huh? Ride with Peter and Don. Don't even ride with him. No, oh, he's running a video. I just looked up and thought, Miss Tina never sits over here. It's kind of something in the back of my mind. Every Christian ought to be perceptive. Can I say this? Every Christian ought to be a pardoning Christian. Verse 13 tells us where to forgive. Can I say it's not easy to forgive? Sometimes we can forgive with our, with our mouth. Brother Clint, I forgive you. But by the time I get to my car, I'm still holding a grudge. That's not forgiveness. Hmm? Can I say that's something God's helped me with over the years? If you stand behind the pulpit, you've got a bullseye on you, and a lot of people are going to run their mouth about you, and that's happened over the years, and the Lord, I don't know, has given me broad shoulders. But there have been people that accused me of things and said things that were lies. And see, you can defend anything but a lie. And I've actually had people come and ask for forgiveness. God's helped me with that, and I'd forgive them, and I'd never treat them any different after they asked me that than I ever treated them before. And that's not easy to do. God has to do that for you. But He will if you ask Him to help you. You have not because you ask not. If you ask Him, you're not asking a misc. If you say, God, create yourself in me. Help me to have a forgiving spirit. Help me to have a positive spirit. Help me to have a loving spirit. Help me to be at peace with you. God, help me. He'll help you. Right. Amen. It's when you're asking for things that don't bring Him glory. He don't really pay much attention. Every Christian ought to be a pardoning Christian. And I preach way too long. Last point. Every Christian ought to be a praising Christian. Well, to praise the Lord in any opportunity. But you know, it's okay to praise one another. It's okay to tell folks, hey, it's good to see you in the house of God. Hey, you've been a blessing to me. Hey, thank you for praying for God. Answer your prayer. You must be a prayer. It's okay to compliment people, but make certain you give the ultimate praise unto the Lord. Uh, and every Christian ought to have words of praise on their lip to God. Amen. Hmm? There's a lot of people like to complain. Uh, I know you don't know this, but years ago I used to work jobs. <laughs> One thing I learned about working jobs is everybody on the low end of the totem pole thinks they know more than the boss man. But they've never walked a mile in a boss man's shoes. And I say it's easy to complain about things. But if we have a positive attitude and we have a praising attitude, instead of, instead of complaining, we might, we might find reason to, to thank God for it. And God might give us some avenues to help us make things better. I found most of the people that do the complaint are the most miserable. And if they get to the point where they, they do some work inside, then all of a sudden they're not complaining as much. They're praising the Lord. And by the way, I don't care how bad you got it, you don't have to look very far and you'll find somebody a whole lot worse than you. You do have.
Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.